understanding tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your love. Father, thank you that before you ask us to serve you, and you do ask us, that you have saved us abundantly, that you've pursued us, that you've bought us and set us free by the blood of the Lamb, even if we don't know that. But Father, give us a spiritual understanding tonight that we need to be drawn closer into relationship with you, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Um, you know, it's, it's really vital and really important that we understand the gospel, the good news of how God draws us, how he first saves us. Because we looked the first night and a little bit last night again at God is the one who's pursuing a relationship with man. Man has departed from God. And the Bible says in Romans 3, and it's quoting from the Psalms and other places in the Old Testament scriptures, there's no one who seeks after God. There's no one who does right. And that includes all of us. That includes everyone. But God has been persistently pursuing us in order to bless us. And our response of love to him is actually the, the beginning point is seeing his love for us. Just understanding it, understanding that he's pursued us and loved us. If you don't see that and you try and serve him, it's only mechanical. It's only out of either fear or force. And God doesn't work that way. So that's something to keep in mind as we move further on in our studies. God is calling people out. That's what the word ecclesia means. He called a people out of all the nations for himself to preserve this truth. He called the Jewish nation and he delivered them from their bondage. And he called the church. And we found, and we're going to find again tonight, that God is seeking people everywhere, not just Jews, not just Western Christianity. He is seeking to add and bring into his fold anyone who desires to be joined to him. We're going to be studying, uh, give me the first slide here, I'm having trouble with that. We're going to be studying the seven churches. There we go. All right. Um, and every night I'll give a little bit of information about the seven churches. Um, tonight I want to talk about, as I've mentioned every night, these seven churches are a chronological progression in general of the Christian age. And many scholars agree on that. And tonight we're going to look at a progression of apostasy. Um, God told Paul, the Bible says in Romans, I'm sorry, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says this, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times that some will give heed to doctrines of devils and they will depart from the faith. And as we look at the letters of, of warning to each of the churches, we can see the progression of apostasy. In the church of Ephesus, Jesus says to them this. He says, These, this, this you do have. He, he rebukes them for having lost their first love. And that's where they had to start. And that's where we have to start. A relationship with God, observing his love toward us and his pursuit of us. We lose sight of that. It doesn't matter how many laws we keep or if we're doing everything right according to the Bible. If we lose the relationship, it's of no value. So Jesus told the church of Ephesus, go back and find your first love. But he says this, he says, this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. At that time, the church in Ephesus, the Bible also says this, you have tested those who claim to be apostles and found them liars, and you have not connected yourself with them. So in other words, there's still, even in the days of Ephesus, there were teachings, the Nicolaitans and people that claimed to be apostles, but when the church listened to what they were teaching, they said, no, 
That's not the truth. And they rejected them. They kept them on the outside. But you can see that they were still, that was still a temptation to the church. But in the church of Smyrna, now Jesus says, this is a rebuke to them. He says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but they are the synagogue of Satan. In other words, now instead of having the the false apostles and the Nicolaitans on the outside, now they're starting to mingle with the church. And we're going to find in Pergamos these words. Jesus says, I have a few things against you because you have there those among you in the church who hold to the doctrine of Balaam. And we're going to look at what the doctrine of Balaam is tonight. Um, And it's more of a general because this is the church of Pergamos. We're studying the church of Smyrna. But the general principle is this. Satan always has uh, apostasy and false teaching and false doctrine that he's trying to bring in to the church. But this is what Jesus says to Pergamos. He says, you have there those who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. And then verse 15 says, thus you also have those who who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. That verse tells us that the doctrine or the teaching of the Nicolaitans is in close harmony with the teaching of Balaam. And this is the scripture, actually, that teaches us, if you want to understand the core principle, the core issues that Pergamos was dealing with, you have to go back to the story of Israel at Baal Peor and understand what the core issue was with Balaam and the Moabite women and the idolatry that happened there. Because this, Jesus is telling us these are the same. So if you want to understand what's happening in the third church in Pergamos, you have to go back and study what's happening, what happened with Balaam. And tomorrow, in the, in the nights to come, we're going to look at Thyatira, which Jesus actually says, you have Jezebel in the church and you're putting up with her. And it's not that, it's not that Jezebel was such a popular name and there was literally a, a woman in the church of Thyatira whose name was Jezebel. What Jesus is saying, the conditions in the church of Thyatira match the darkness that was in Israel at the time when Ahab and Jezebel were ruling And in order to understand what's happening in Thyatira, you have to go back and study 1 Kings 15, 16, and 17 and understand what Elijah and what was going on in Israel. And we'll do that in in the coming night. But tonight we're going to see that apostasy is a threat in all ages. Apostasy simply means to step out of the path. God has laid down a path. He has marked out a path. He spoke his will. He gave his law. He gave the commandments. He spoke his word to Moses. He taught the people. And it's when we step out of the things that God has revealed that we are going into what the Bible calls apostasy. It is stepping out from the clear teaching of Scripture. And we're going to see that very early, and and this is just the history of Israel, very early Israel, Forty days after they made the covenant with God, they were worshiping the, the Apis bull of Egypt, okay? Very soon. Forty years later at Baal Peor, which we'll look at a little bit tonight, they committed harlotry with the Moabite women and they invited them to their uh, sacrifices and they went and they bowed down to other gods. Then at the height of Perhaps you could say, you could make a good argument at the height of Israel's dynasty, her kingly dynasty under Solomon, they really went into apostasy. And even further, they went into apostasy under Jezebel and Ahab. And we'll look at that in a coming night. But in the same way, the church of Ephesus has Nicolaitans, even though the church hates the deeds of them. In the second church, Smyrna, there are some in the church who claim to be Jews, but Jesus identifies them and says, I know they're not, yet they're part of the church. 
In Pergamos, Jesus says, you have some there who are teaching this doctrine. And by the time Thyatira comes around, Jesus says, you're allowing this woman Jezebel to seduce my servants. She calls herself a prophetess. She's actually teaching in my church and you're putting up with it. So there's a progression of apostasy. And tonight we're going to take a look at... um, We're going to take a look at Israel and pagan practices. And it's not focused on one church. It's actually a threat during the whole church period. But the principles that we're going to learn are going to carry us for the next two studies. So let's take a look at... um, these, These were the things that God shared with Israel when he brought them out of Egypt. This is what... what the religion, one of the many cults of Egypt uh, looked like. And Israel would have been familiar with this. There was a bull, they worshipped him by the name Apis and he was a god, but then they would take a a, a physical bull and then worship that bull as if he was the god. Um, And this is actually the the impetus behind the story of worshipping the golden calf because this is what they had seen in Egypt. Um, And often the apis bull has a sun disc right here between the horns and other, um, actually I think I have a a picture of it. Uh, Actually there's one mounted right there, I don't know if you can see it. And it's actually worshiping two gods at the same time. And it's interesting, if you look at the story very carefully in the book of Exodus, when they bow down to the calf, Aaron actually says, these are your gods, plural, that brought you out of Egypt. So they are reverting to the pagan practice there in Egypt. But this is what God told his people. Leviticus 18, 1 through 3, he said this, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel, say to them, I am the Lord your God. According to the doings or the customs of the land of Egypt where you did dwell, you shall not do. And according to the doings or the customs of the land of Canaan where I am bringing you, you shall not do. You shall you sh- nor shall you walk in their ordinances or their commands. So God is being very clear. He's being very careful. You're, you've seen idolatry in Egypt. Do not follow that pattern. You're going to see idolatry in Canaan. Do not follow that pattern. Follow what I have taught you. Here's another scripture, Exodus 23. God's speaking to Israel. My angel will go before you and bring you to the Ammonites, to the Hittites, to the Perizzites, to the Canaanites, to the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Now these were the very powerful nations that were inhabiting the land of Canaan at that time. And there were giants in Canaan, as the Bible tells us. These, uh, These nations... Not only were they very powerful, but they were very corrupt. Um, It's often, and I've heard this question often growing up in the Bible, um, why would God command the genocide of a whole nation? It's interesting because in, in Genesis chapter 15, God tells Abraham, I'm going to bring you back here, but not yet. I'm going to give you this land, but not now. It's going to be 400 years until the sins of these people have filled up their cup. In other words, God is saying, God is saying, I I know I'm going to have to judge this people, but I'm going to give them more time. And God gives them 400 years of probation. He, they did have a chance and there were, I'm certain there were people that heeded the, I'm, the Bible doesn't tell us clearly what uh, means or methods God used to try and bring them out of the, the base idolatry that they were um, engaged in. But I will tell you this, one of the gods that was worshipped in Canaan was the god Moloch. And Moloch, um, as I've been doing studying and preparing for these, uh, I've been trying to put my finger on, because there, there are a million gods, uh, and they all have, as soon as the name of one god 
goes into another language, its, its name shifts just a little bit, and it's very difficult to keep track of. All right, well, there's Mel- Melchor in Phoenicia, and Moloch in Canaan, and another, you know, and all of these, you know, scholars are sure that these names, it's all actually a different name for the same God, but it's being transformed as it goes from one language to the next, because many of the cultic rituals and things surrounding it are, are still very connected. And, and all of these, you know, just like um, Zeus is the, now which one is it? I can never remember. Is Zeus the, the king god of the Romans or the Greeks? The Greeks. So Jupiter for the Romans, right? But it's the same god that they're worshiping, but because it's a different language, it goes by a different name. And then like in Canaan, there was Asherah. And there was uh, Asarte in other parts. And in Isis in Egypt, And so the same goddess, but the name was continually changing. And the reason we know it's the same is because, again, many of the same cultic, you know, the goddess of fertility or or the wife of Baal, the the chief god or whatever. And, And there were many gods. And so it's difficult and confusing. But as I've been studying, it has just been, I just can't keep studying it because it makes me want to vomit. It is, th- there was human sacrifice, and not just human sacrifice, but sacrifice of little babies, putting them on the fire before these gods, and they would play music so they couldn't hear the screams of these children. It was, it was it's horrible. And, and then if the mother cried out, then the sacrifice didn't count. And so she had to gag herself. She had to not, I mean, horrible, horrible things. And I I just gotten sick. I said, God, I don't need to know all those details. You said they passed their children, their sons and their daughters through the fire. I figured out what that means. That's enough. I don't need to know anymore. But this is one reason why God says, I have to put an end to that. Because that not only is destroying innocent lives of unborn children, but it is allowing this to spread further and further and further. And so this is what God told Israel. Exodus 23, he says, my angel's gonna go before you as I bring you into the land of all these powerful tribes and I will cut them off. Their time of probation was over. God was going to judge them. And you shall not bow down to their gods, nor shall you serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down all their sacred pillars. In other words, God was saying, the practices of these nations are so vile, you shall leave nothing that is a reminder in the place that I give you, in the places you occupy. You go to the groves and the high hills and you cut them down because these are bastions of satanic disgust and filth where children have been slaughtered and offered and vile things have been done. And God says, wipe it out from the memory. He goes on, he says, you shall make no covenant with these people. You shall not have any intimate or close relations, no trade agreements. You you shall not make any covenant with their God. They shall not dwell in your land. You're to drive them out, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. So God says, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to, I have... I have judged them. I have given them 400 years and their time is up. The cup of their iniquity is full. The blood of their sons and daughters is crying out to me and they are to be judged and destroyed. Another scripture, Exodus 34, God speaking again, the same principle, God says to Israel, take heed to yourself lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, and lest it be a snare in your midst. You shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and play the harlot with their gods, and make sacrifices to their gods, and one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice. See, 
Israel had entered into a marriage covenant with God, as we learned last night, that we will serve you, you will be our husband, and we will know no one else. And this is why God uses the word harlot, because if they are then to go worship another God after they've made this marriage covenant with him, they're committing spiritual adultery. And this is why God says he's jealous. God is not some kind of psychotic, jealous boyfriend who has to know where Israel is all the time. And she needs to carry her cell phone and he's constantly tracking her down. Israel has voluntarily entered into the covenant to marry God. They have become husband and wife. Would you be jealous if your spouse was cheating on you with someone else? Of course you would. And it would be a righteous jealousy because when you are married, it's forsaking all others and taking this one to yourself. And so God says, don't make any covenant with these people lest you play the harlot with them and you take of his, of his daughters for your sons and his daughters and play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlot with your gods. You shall make no molded gods for yourself nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor shall you take their daughter for your son. And we're going to find, and I believe it's tomorrow, um, one of the premier kings of Israel who did this and what the results were. Um, Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 8 Again, it's more the same. You shall not make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their sons or take their daughter for your sons. For they will turn you away from following me to serve other gods. And the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you to destroy you suddenly. God did not want this for his people. And he warned them. There are many other scriptures I could share with you. Just in the Torah. The Bible tells us, though, now you might say it might sound like God is wanting Israel to wall themselves off from all the other nations and not even relate to them or touch them. Not exactly. He does not want them connected with idolatry and he does not want them intimately connected with someone that is practicing pagan idolatry and ritual. He does not want them to have familial ties He does not want them to have close trade agreements and this kind of thing because then they'll become familiar with this. But from the very beginning, there was a mixed multitude, the Bible says, that went out of Egypt. In other words, there were some Israelites that were married to Egyptians and there were some Egyptians that had converted and there were some Egyptians that were there just because they wanted to escape the plagues. All of those are true. But look at here, Exodus 12, verse 38. A mixed multitude went up with them, and flocks and herds, and a great deal of livestock. So already among Israel are many people of other nations, mostly Egyptians at this point. But you know, in the the Bible story, we find out that uh, Aaron and Miriam are angry with Moses because he married an Ethiopian woman. And he was within his right to do that. God had not, she was, she was a believer. He didn't join himself to a pagan wife. But just as there is today racial inequality and racial prejudice and injustice, so also in that time. And God rebuked Miriam and Aaron for what they had done. Deuteronomy 23, notice this. This is how God feels about the foreigner. These verses are of an altogether different character than the ones that we, that we read before. Notice this. God says to Israel, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian, because you are an alien in his land. And the children of the third generation, born to the Edomite or born to the Egyptian, they may enter into the assembly of the Lord. In other words, You are not to look down on them and despise them. And if they convert and want to serve me and keep my covenant, you shall not despise them or look down on them. Another scripture, Joshua 6, 17, tells us this. We know that the first city to be conquered in Canaan was the city of Jericho. But there was a harlot 
in that city. And no doubt she was probably a harlot connected with pagan ritual, but she showed kindness to the two spies that were there, and she believed that the God of Israel was going to destroy them. She was well acquainted with the wickedness in the city, and she says, look, I I will hide you, but show mercy to me and my family. And because she converted and expressed a desire to leave Jericho and to connect herself with Israel, this is what happened. The city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that were sent. And notice this a few verses later in the same chapter. Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. She actually ends up being one of the people in the genealogy of Christ's coming. God honored her faith. Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19 says, The Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. And he shows no no partiality, nor does he take a bribe. But he administers justice for the fatherless and and the widow, and he loves the stranger or the foreigner. He giving them food and clothing. Therefore, because God loves the foreigner, therefore you love the foreigner. For you were foreigners or strangers in the land of Egypt. See, this is, this is the principle. We'll come to it here in a second. But also we see this in the book of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess. And as we'll find from the story tonight, that was the very nation that hired Balaam to bring Israel's downfall. And Ruth, um, when she was asked by her mother-in-law to turn back to her gods and to her family, this is what she, this is what Naomi said to her: "Look, your sister has gone. Your sister-in-law has gone back to her people, back to Moab, and she has returned to her gods. You return also with your sister-in-law." But Ruth said this: "And treat me not to leave you. Don't ask me again to depart from you." or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. And notice this, your God will be my God. She was turning her back. I don't remember, I think it's Shemosh who's the God of the Moabites. She was turning her back on the God of Shemosh. She was turning her back on her family, and she says, what you have in the God of Israel is greater, and I will join myself to that. I will become an Israelite. I will keep his covenant. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. And you read in those four chapters in that book and you find that this woman, even among Israel, with the history that the Moabites had, she was esteemed as a faithful, God-fearing woman. And God honored her and she again had part in being part of the Davidic line from which Jesus' ancestry was, even though she was a Moabite. This is how God feels about about foreigners and outsiders. He wants them to come in. Isaiah 56, 6 through 7 says, The sons of the foreigner, those who join themselves to the Lord, to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling my Sabbath and who will hold fast to my covenant. How does God feel about them? Even them I will bring into my holy mountain. I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted upon my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. God is seeking a people, ecclesia, to come out and to join themselves to him and keep his covenant And it matters not where we're from. We don't have to have Jewish blood in our our body to be part of this because God promised Abraham, through you, 
all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And this is the root of the principle, Jeremiah chapter 15. This is from the NASB version of the Bible because I like the way that it's clearer here. But God tells Jeremiah, the people who are in apostasy, for their part, they may turn to you. But as for you, Jeremiah, you shall not compromise. You shall not swerve from what I have told you. You are not to turn to them. Do you understand? That is the root of the principle. If a Gentile converts and wishes to join himself to Israel and serve the Lord and keep his covenant and God's people and God are to receive him, they are not to despise him, they are to love him and God will accept them. But God warns his people. He says, if you turn to the Gentiles and you serve their gods and you walk in their ways and their commands, I will also turn from you. You know what? And, and it is merciful also that God gives this. Because you know what? Imagine, imagine this. God allowed people to turn away from him and serve other gods, and he never chastened them. In the day of judgment, those people could come back and say, God, this is where I was. I was walking down the path to hell and you never put up a road sign in the way. See, this is what God is doing when he, he, he will bless you as much as he can, but if you're walking in his covenant, he is able to abundantly bless. But when you're walking outside of the covenant, God in his mercy is forced to withdraw some of those blessings. Not because he wants to destroy you, but because he wants to awaken you to the dire danger that we're in. So what happened with Israel? The Bible says this in Judges 2. It says, The angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bohem and said, I led you up from Egypt. I brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Part of the covenant is that God will curse Israel when they're out of the covenant. And then he said, you shall make no covenant. I, re- I told you this. You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You are to tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. And rightly so. Rightly so. The Bible says that after God spoke that to him, they called the name of the place Bohem, which means weeping. And there they sacrificed to the Lord. We're not told exactly what happened there, but I imagine that they they wept because they had not followed the commands of the Lord. And they turned and returned to God and offered sacrifice. And Joshua was there. And after they had recommitted themselves, I imagine, to the Lord, then he dismissed the children of Israel and each went to their own inheritance to possess the land. You know, when God rebukes us, we need to follow the example of Israel. Even when he tells us that bad things are going to happen, we need to turn back. But this is what the rest of the chapter says. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. But when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, Another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger, They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So this is what he did. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of all their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. 
And God did this in mercy. Because if he continues to shine light while we walk down the primrose path, apparently, to hell, that is not merciful. If we do not discipline our children when they are going out of the way and we are letting, letting them and allowing them to form evil and corrupt and bad characters and stand by and do nothing but praise them, guess what? Their actions are now on our shoulders too. We cannot do this as parents and God does not do it as faithful and loving God to us. What happened at Acacia Grove? What happened with Balaam? The same thing that we've been studying here. Israel remained at Acacia Grove and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. Now this was a carefully crafted plan because when Balaam could not curse the people, he wanted the reward that Balak was offering him. And so Balaam said, you know what? You can't touch the people. If they're faithful to the covenant, you will not be able to destroy them. And I will not be able to curse them because God says those who walk in faithfully in my covenant, I will bless. And I have blessed and no one can reverse it. And Balaam schemed in his mind and he said, Balak, if you cause them to sin and do against the covenant, then God himself will destroy them and you won't have to lift a finger. And so that is what Balak did. He sent the women of Moab into the camp and they, the men began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. And then the women invited the people, the Israelites, to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and they bowed down to their gods. We're going to find that the, that the seven letters to the seven churches repeats the same history over and over again. My people commit sexual immorality and they eat things sacrificed to idols. If God's people had listened faithfully, all those who convert you are to accept and you are to love, but you are not to make close relations with others. If they had listened to that faithfully, they would never have fallen into this. I'm gonna to have to skip through some of these New Testament verses here, but the New Testament is the, the, the law is the same for the New Testament church. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 6, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with dark? What accord is there between Christ and Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever and what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? None. He comes down, he says, you are the temple of the living God. God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. Ecclesia, come out and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch anything that is unclean and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And Paul is quoting many places from the Old Testament, but he's given instruction to the church today. The same principle that Israel was to hold to in being faithful to God and not turning aside after idols. You know what? I, I don't know about you, but I don't have any temptation to bow down to a hunk of gold or a block of wood. But you know what? There are many other idols that Satan dangles in front of us today. Covetousness, Paul says, is idolatry. And there are many Christians that are tied up with covetousness so tightly that they will not even return to God the, the part that he's asked. And I could tell you, I was in $50,000 worth of debt to the IRS and I had not been faithful in the tenth that the Lord had asked from me. And I started returning the tenth that I was getting at that time. And within two years, I don't know how it happened. The math doesn't make sense. And I have a math minor. It doesn't make any sense. I've taken calculus and differential equations and all that junk. But it didn't make any sense. But when I started being faithful to the covenant, God cleared my debt. It's faithfulness to the word of God. It's faithfulness to the covenant that brings the blessing. And when we compromise... And when we walk out of the way and when we say, I know what God has said, but I know it's, it's not that big a deal. I'd rather do this. That's when we get into trouble. That's when Israel got into trouble. And that's when the church gets into trouble today. 
James 4 says this, adulterers, he's speaking to the church, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is war with God? Therefore, whoever wants to become a friend of the world and the values and make covenants and live like the world, he makes himself an enemy of God. God is calling a people out of the world, ecclesia. He's calling people, come out, come out. And this is the principle. Israel's illicit relations with other nations led to idolatry. When Solomon connected himself with foreign wives, it wasn't long before Solomon was worshiping before these gods. The same with the church. The church's illicit relationship with Roman power and government is what led her into idolatry. By making an unbiblical connection with pagan powers brought idolatry and unfaithfulness into the church. And God is calling a people out today. He's calling us out back to faithfulness to his covenant, back to faithfulness to him. What will you choose? God loves you. He asks you to serve him willingly after he saves you. He promises blessings for choosing him and walking in his path. He, he promises you eternal life and peace on this, in this world now, today. Like Joshua said to ancient Israel, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether it be the gods that your ancestors worship on the other side of the river or whether it be the God who brought you out of Egypt. As for me and my house, we will choose, we will serve the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, um, I know that you're here. You're moving on my heart and you're moving on the hearts of people who are hearing your words. Father, we confess to you that we are broken and a rebellious people, but you promised to give us a new heart. Father, for all those here and all those who are watching, if there's any part of their heart that wants to come home to you, I'm praying for them. Father, give us a heart to desire you and help us walk in your ways. We cannot do it without your strength. Cleanse us from all defilement. Help us join ourselves and make a covenant to walk near you and in your law and in your good statutes and commands and show yourself faithful to what you've promised. Bless each one here tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This building is uh, acoustically very reflective. That's why I could easily project my voice without uh, any difficulties, but I think the folks who are listening through live streaming would be thinking I turn into a fish. <laughs> so I'll have to use the microphone. Uh, we were talking yesterday, we finished yesterday with the uh, very important decision which was made by the first apostolic council at uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and the decision was not about setting for two different groups, two different standards. But if I would translate this into today's modern Christian language, I would put it as the following question. The baptism, is this the beginning of the journey or the celebration of the achievement? And what do you think the Apostolic Council did? First or the second? It was the first. It was the first. 
It was the beginning. They, they clearly stated that all these people who are, need to be let in on the equal footing to start their walk with Jesus. They don't have to deserve and earn and perform before they will be awarded the privilege. Basically, this is the major, major subject of the apostolic letters which Paul wrote to Galatians, to Romans, to Ephesians, and to Colossians. But let us go back uh, and uh, from the Bible to the history. And here I'm showing you a timeline uh, of the major periods which we are studying. Ephesus, the period starts, here is our crucifixion, 31 AD, and it lasts for a hundred years. Then it is replaced by Smyrna, and this is what we're gonna talk about tonight, about this transition about this parting the way. In fact, the title I took from the book which was written by a famous uh, Jewish scholar, a professor of UC Berkeley in California, Daniel Boyarin, who uh, the book is titled Judaism and Christianity, Parting the Way. So. Before we get there, let's take a look at what prophetically the book of Revelation through the pen of John, another famous disciple of Jesus, another famous important figure in the uh, establishment of Christianity. We talked yesterday about Barnabas. We talked yesterday about Paul. Here's John. And here what John talks about the period of Ephesus. And uh, Ed has mentioned this. We're going to dive deeper into these words. This thing says, he who holds the seven stars in the right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your words, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested uh, those who say they are apostles and are not, and they have found them liars, and you have preserved to have my uh, patience and labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Well, the Nicolaitans, they're a little bit, or Nicolaitans, you can probably say it in uh, English, they're much more difficult to figure out who these guys are, but I want to focus on these guys. The ones who say they are apostles, but they're not. I want to make sure you understand the text. Are these guys apostles? What do you see? are not. 
They are imposters. They are trying to present themselves as apostles. They are modern identity thefts. So they are trying to pretend to be ones, but John is labeling them right away as liars. Who these guys are? Well, first of all, let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 21, and uh, read a very important definition of apostles. You see, uh, back when I was... Uh, yeah, when I was a child, I loved this Russian story about the famous captain who had his yacht and uh, participated in the uh, r yacht race around the globe. And there, they were talking about, in one of the stories, they were talking about the fishing and about a very special kind of Dutch herring. And the first thing they came to a conclusion after fishing a little bit is this. Every herring is a fish, but not every fish is a herring. <laughs> so this is the rule. I, I call it the rule of herring. I'm going to give you in the translation to the book of Acts. Every apostle is a disciple. Remember yesterday we talked about the disciples. Every apostle is a disciple, but not every disciple is the apostle. That's important distinction. Apostleship is a very, very, very important role and here, let's see what the book of Acts teach us about it. Here it says in chapter 1, Therefore, of this man who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. You see the definition? Uh, it's Peter's words. Uh, Peter is talking to the present disciples and apostles about the situation which they have with the suicide of Judas. You know why he committed suicide. I'm not going to repeat that story. But they needed to replace the apostle because there has to be 12 apostles. And they were short of one. So <coughs> there was a special criteria to fill the place. And they were looking among many disciples for the one who was with them since John the Baptist. So the apostle had to be the disciple of John the Baptist, graduate from John the Baptist, and move up with Jesus spend all three years with Jesus and witness his resurrection. And there has to be only 12 because there were definitely more than 12, but Jesus selected 12. And we know that the number of 12, it, actually the number 12 is a very important number. Uh, there are two important, I mean, there are many speculations about biblical numerology, but there is one, there are two very important numbers 
that are in the Bible, uh, and these numbers are three and four. Do you know to whom number three would be? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That's three. To what the four would be? Four winds of heaven. Okay? Uh, this is basic uh, thing even since the oldest old times, you know, Sumerian kings call themselves in the uh, 3000, third millennium cones, you know, Lugal Ubdalimubi, the ruler of the four wings of heaven. That's the creation. So think about this. Have you read in the Bible the number seven? What is, it, what is seven made of? Three and four. So that is the number of, uh, of uh, completion. Three God, four creation. What about 12? It's three by four. It's the number of covenant. We have 12 tribes. Are they really 12? Well, if you count carefully with Ephraim and Manasseh, you got 13. But Levites don't have their place. Guess what? Eventually, you'll get Paul. But that's okay. <laughs> this corresponds, you know, there is a definite correlation. 12 the, Israel, the old covenant Israel is based of the 12 tribes. The new covenant Israel is based of the 12 apostles. All of them who were Jewish. That's why the new covenant is with Israel and Judah. But here they're selecting that person and they got... Uh, 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 you know, again, they have two different people. Somebody, Joseph Barsabbas. See? Always two names. They didn't mind that. And then Justus uh, Matathias. So they got with, Mat with uh, uh, or Matthias. Uh, they, they got with Matthias. So, but there was a, a very specific criteria. The important part of all of it is that it is the apostles who wrote the books, who became the part of the New Testament canon. The Gospels, the Epistles, the Book of Acts, the Apocalypse. Of course, the Book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke, it's Luke, but we know that Luke was working for, on behalf of Paul. So it's basically, that's why half of the uh, book of Acts, it's all Paul, just because it was on behalf of Paul the book was written. So Luke is the same way, the gospel. So what has happened with these imposters? Very simple. Have you heard of Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, what the book of Revelation is talking about? There would be many people who would try to play apostles and write their ideas in the Gospels that are actually not, you know, their own. In other words, they would pretend to be someone who they are not. You know, think about, for example, Gospel of Peter. You can't have Gospel of Peter because we know that the closest associate of Peter was John Mark. 
And we have the Gospel of Mark. So why would we have the Gospel of Mark, which was written on behalf of Peter, and the Gospel of Peter? Makes absolutely no sense. And so these are the challenges that uh, the church of Ephesus had But besides ideological challenges, there were serious political challenges. And the Syria, probably the most serious political challenge was the first Judean war that happened in uh, from uh, technically 64 to 70. This war was started by a literally a terrorist group, which was called Zealots. Zealots hoped to achieve the same result as Maccabees achieved uh, 200 years before them, but they badly lost. (coughs) Jerusalem was destroyed. The Temple Menorah was the only temple furniture which we know was saved from the inferno as we see it here in the uh, fresco or barrelief on the uh, triumphant uh, arch in Rome. And uh, it was a huge tragedy. This tragedy engulfed Jews of all beliefs, including those who believed in Jesus. But those who believed in Jesus had one important information from their Lord. This information is recorded in both Gospels, in Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24 and in gospel of luke chapter 21 this information was pertaining the situation that you know as uh, the book of gospel of luke points it out i don't have it on the slide when you see jerusalem surrounded by the armies know that you got to run away uh christians uh departed from jerusalem They crossed the Jordan River, and they settled for a while in the town which is excavated today, known as Pella. Uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. With this destruction, Essenes were killed off. You know, Qumran was destroyed by Romans. The Sadducees, who were mainly the priests, they perished all there. Uh, Zealots held out in the fortress out at the Dead Sea uh, called Masada for three years, and Masada fell, and the remaining surviving Zealots ended up committing a suicide. But Pharisees, they were the ones who survived. The story is telling as follows. The leader of Pharisees at that time uh, was named Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. In English, uh, John the son of Zacchaeus. (laughs) He, as well as other Pharisaic leaders, saw that this war will not end with victory. In fact, Similar to Christians, uh, Pharisees did not believe in any politics. All what Pharisees wanted was to be let alone studying the Torah. And so Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai got a plan. Jerusalem was on a lockdown. Unlike Christians who knew what was coming, Pharisees were behind understanding and figuring out. They had, you know, Christians had revelation from Jesus. Pharisees had to figure it out on their own. 
So when the city was under the siege and zealots locked everybody down, the only way you could live the city was dead, being dead. And so uh, Yohanan ben Zakai pretended to be dead. Uh, his disciples lowered him down on the rope uh, uh, along the wall, on the other side of the wall. They dropped him. He rolled over, uh, cut the burial cloth, and was arrested by Romans and brought to General Vespasian. When he saw General Vespasian, he greeted him with the words, Vivat Emperor. Uh, Vespasian got upset. What are you doing, foolish old man? Calling me an emperor, how dare our emperor is Nero. So he ordered Yohanan ben Zakai to be, uh, to be uh, jailed. So sometimes later, Nero, the Roman emperor, was assassinated, and, uh, Yoh uh, and uh, the army declared. Vespasian as emperor. Then Vespasian remembered about the foolish old Jew and he ordered to brought him back to his presence. So as soon as Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai arrived, he said, okay, you old Jew, I didn't know you were a prophet. So your prophecy is fulfilled. Now Tell me what you want, and I will grant it. So Yohanan ben Zakai says, all right, all I want you to know that my dis I am a Pharisee. My disciples are Pharisees. We're not the enemies of Rome. If you leave us alone, give us something, some village where we could have our academy or school, we would be fine and will not intervene in any politics. And the wish was granted. Vespasian gave a little village, which is in the middle of Judea, village of Yavne or Jamnia in English. And that's where the school was reopened and the Pharisees went to work. What they really were about, two things. Number one, they wanted to, ca to codify and commit to writing the oral tradition of their elders. And second, they needed to come up with some way of preserving Judaism without a temple. Because all what Judaism is, all, is about is keeping the commandments. This is who you are. You're a Jew, keeping the commandments. And half of the commandments are connected with the temple. If you, you know, there, are, there is a symbolic number of 613 commandments in the Torah, and half of them are connected with temple, and they cannot do anything about them now. So they decided to develop patches, certain uh, liturgical elements, prayers. For example, even till this day, this, the traditional Orthodox synagogue operates on the schedule which existed in the temple, such as in the temple on daily basis, you have morning sacrifice, then you have uh, cereal offerings, and then you have evening sacrifice. This is called continuous or daily uh, ministry. So when you go to the Orthodox community, somewhere like New York, they would have, their synagogue would be open every day and they would come and they would do a morning prayer. 
called Shacharit. Then about 1 o'clock p.m., they would gather for the afternoon prayer, which is called the same word as the cereal offering. And then they would do by the sundown the evening prayer. In other words, what they are trying to do is to temporarily, because remember, they always expect the temple to be rebuilt. So they are waiting for the temporary uh, solution, some kind of a patch. I compare it to a ship which was battered by a torpedo. When the, there is a certain survivability uh, with plan which every uh, ship commander executes. So uh, to, to preserve the buoyancy of the ship, uh, they do, number one, they have to isolate the compartment with the airtight, watertight doors where the water is coming, which is flooded through the uh, hole in the hull. And then they would bring the pumps in and start pumping the water out. And then they would have a big plaster made out of some kind of a rubber uh, fabric or whatever, and they'll try to put it over the uh, hull, and so, uh, and, and the, 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 the ship would be listing, but it still would be buoyant enough to make to the port. And this is what, this is how they do Judaism without a temple. Well, Christianity had a different view. Number one, for example, position of Paul, right there in 1 Corinthians, talking about the sacrifice. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. In fact, Paul, with the help of Luke, is developing and in a way preparing Christians to the inevitability of the loss of the temple. This is what he does in the book of Hebrews chapter 8 and 9. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Hebrews 8, 13, a, a most misunderstood text in the Bible says and that he says a new covenant he has made the first obsolete and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away so as you can see uh, unfortunately uh, this type of reading out of context give many theologians this kind of uh, diagram. Oh, the old covenant is the law, the new covenant is grace. See, that's why I put uh, several question marks, because in a context we need to continue reading, and when we read further we realize that the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in and the earthly sanctuary. So this is the definition of the old covenant that Paul gives to Christians. It is, it is, this is what is happening to the temple. The temple is becoming obsolete because the main component of the temple sacrifice, temple service, a sacrifice, is now being sacrificed once and for all. And so this is what uh, Paul is talking. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all is not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. See, 
Basically, Paul is even insisting that the tabernacle or the temple has to go. There is no other way to clear the way for the new and better covenant where, as we see here, the old one, the first, was symbolic of the present time imposed until the time of reformation and here is the time of reformation the time of reformation according to hebrews is the christ being the high priest of good things to come with greater and more perfect tabernacle who comes into the most holy and obtains the eternal redemption you see these are the alternatives. Basically, I imagine it like this if we go with the ship. In the Pharisaic Judaism was trying to use the survival skills and they were patching the bridge in a hull and they were trying to do their best to steer the ship which was listing into the port until they get to the port and they hope that there would be a port. By this I mean restoration of the temple. Where Paul says, I think God has a little bit better ship. Why don't we abandon this ship altogether? Because here is this new ship. It's going to dock we're going to move everything to the new ship and let this one sink because the new ship is much better because it's the heavenly sanctuary, not the earthly sanctuary. Okay? After the destruction of the temple, this vision is reinforced in John's revelation. Look at this. John is seen here when he hears the voice, I am Alpha and Omega. He turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, he saw seven golden lampstands. Think of the context. I'll take you back to this picture. This is how Menorah was the last scene. 20 years, roughly, before this book was written, or this vision on the island of Patmos took place. So here, John is seeing the greater Menorah. So, the message of Paul was pre in Hebrews was prepara uh, preparatory, where the message of John was encouraging and comforting. So basically, this is what begins to form the 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 two alternative views. Of the temple, begin, this is a dividing line in a way. But this dividing line has not divided and has not uh, crystallized Christianity as a separate religion. John does see the temple in heaven, as you can see here in chapter 8, he sees the golden altar, then uh, the pinnacle of the book of Revelation is uh, opening of the temple in heaven and seeing the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. So this is the message. This is the message of comfort that Jesus is the high priest and there is an atonement 
and everything is, in contr- is under control, even though the temple is destroyed. Being this, two different perspectives of the event. Basically, after the destruction of the temple, the Pharisees, or their successors, keep looking forward for the restoration of the temple, whereas Jesus, and then Paul, and then John, direct the uh, attention of their followers upward. See, forward in time, upward in space. This is the difference. But it still remains the same people. According to Roman law, every single Greek or Gentile who accepts belief in one God is considered a Jew. Romans, Roman jurists do not make a difference how these people look at what happened in Jerusalem and what do they think of Jesus. What Roman jurists care is whether a person worships I emperor or doesn't. Because the cult of emperor was very, very significant. And so this is what makes everybody who believes in one God, God the Creator, a Jew. So Christians, as we learned yesterday, as well as Pharisees, are the denomination within Judaism. And so, even though the first Judean war ended up with destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, it still preserved the basic rights that Jews had within Roman Empire, being an exemption from worshiping emperor. That's important. However, the second Jewish war, or the second revolt, uh, known as Bar Kokhba revolt, changes this situation drastically. Who was Bar Kokhba? This man's name was Simon or Shimon Bar Kosiba, which is basically in English, Simon the son of Kosiba. He led the rebellion, and rabbis called him, instead of Bar Kosiba, Bar Kochba. Kochba in Aramaic means star. Do you know anything about the star? First of all, the prophecy which was spoken way, way back during Exodus by Balaam. The star is coming from Jacob. That is the star that led wise men to the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem. So the star was an old prophecy which was known to everybody talking about Messiah. The problem is, look at the year. This was way more than a century later. And this was a big, big problem. Bar Kokhba rebellion led to annihilation of Judea. Uh, Emperor Hadrian crushed the rebellion, and uh, many, and Jews, regardless of their attitude to Jesus, badly suffered. Badly. And the persecution of Jews began, and Christians 
as well. This is why Smyrna, the period of Smyrna, uh, as it is known and reflected in the book of <clears throat> in the uh, book of Revelation, is connected with persecution. Persecutions always took place, you know, uh, there were accusations of Christians uh, during the time of Nero that they burned Rome and so forth. But Hadrian started a worldwide persecution of anybody who believed in God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they didn't care if he was a Christian or, or, or if it was a Christian or a Jew. Uh, study of the scripture was outlawed. Uh, any kind of rituals, uh, circumcisions were outlawed. So if circumcision was not a huge concern for Christians, but study of the scripture definitely was. And this is how Smyrna is characterized by many deaths. That's why the word Smyrna means myrrh. Myrrh is the substance, it's a sap, it's a mixture of different saps that are aromatic, that are used for uh, burial. That's why the name is symbolic. <coughs> by the way, Ephesus <coughs> is also symbolic. The word Ephesus means beloved. Smyrna means myrrh. So let's read how uh, John characterizes Smyrna. This thing says the first and the last, who was dead and who came to life. See, that these are the words of encouragement uh, talking about the death during the Smyrna period. I know your works, your tribulation, we just talked about, your poverty, but here is what I want us to focus our attention. I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews and they're not, but they're synagogue of Satan. Now, I want us to really look at these words. Blasphemy of those, the pronoun those, are those Jews? Not. They are not. They are not. They pretend to be, but the text says they are not. In fact, they use the word blasphemy. According to John chapter 10, Jesus was accused of blasphemy by calling himself God after he said, I and the Father is one. So here we have a very interesting group of people who are not Jews but pretend to be that way. Very similar language. Look at this. See, in Ephesus, there are apostles, but who pretend to be that way. In Smyrna, there are Jews who are pretend to be that way. And so, here is what, here is one of them. I want to introduce you to one of the uh, literatures, lit literature documents of the Christianity of the first century. It was somebody by the name Barnabas. Of course, not the Barnabas whom we talked about yesterday. That Barnabas could not have lived that long. That Barnabas was a Levite from uh, Cyprus. This fellow could have had the name Barnabas, but he was from Alexandria. 
Alexandria was very known for his, for its philosophical schools. And tomorrow we'll talk. You, you'll have your ears full about Alexandria and philosophy. But that's tomorrow. But today, I want to read to you what in particular does he write. He wrote lots of things. Uh, one of the very characteristic uh, of, um, uh, of Alexandrian school was they, they loved allegories. Everything was symbolic. Moses, why did he build the temple? He writes in the previous chapter. It was wrong. Temple was the symbol. Now to take a look at this. Further, he says to them, he refers to Isaiah. Your new moons and Sabbath I cannot endure. Ye perceive how he speaks. Your present Sabbath are not acceptable to me. But that is which I may, I have made, namely this. When given rest to all things, I have made, I, I shall make the beginning of eighth day, that is, a beginning of another world. Therefore, also we keep the eighth day with joyfulness, the day which, on which Jesus rose again from the dead. When he has manifested himself, he ascended into heavens. Do you see? This is the first, folks, this is the first attempt to destroy the fundamental sign by which Jews are known. Remember what the Bible says. You shall keep the Sabbath as a sign between me and you. Sabbath was always a sign connected with Jews. In fact, after the First Judean War, actually during the First Judean War, Romans started the first anti-Semitic propaganda. Uh, one of the records shows a play. Romans, as well as Greeks, they loved theaters. So here was a comedy in theater. In, you know, the old amphitheaters with many steps. On the stage, a camel is led. And camel wears a sackcloth. The voice of the narrator asks, why is the camel wearing a sackcloth? Oh, it is because it's, this camel is Jewish, and today is Sabbath, and so on Jewish Sabbath, Jews don't feed their camels. Not true, uh, but this is how they pre present it. And that's why the camel is fasting. Of course, the whole auditorium explodes with laughter. So the stage was set, and the thinking got going. This is what is happening. This is this kind of literature which we have in the second century reveals to us who these people were, the impastor Jews. They pretended to write, see, he uses the prophets. You know, his whole argument is that he pulls the text of Isaiah out of context, and he says, see, I can't endure the Sabbath, so we need to change it. To change it to the eighth day, yeah. You know what the eighth day could be could, means. The day which is on which the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. Folks, 
I hear a lot of conversation. Oh, it was done by Constantine. No. The beginning of this kind of thinking was early second century. And the persecution which arose after Barkov rebellion brought the fuel to the fire of rejecting everything Jewish. You see, there has to be this fine line. And I've shown you the difference, right? The difference in how Jews look at the destruction of the temple compared to how Christians look at the destruction of the temple. But we have to be very balanced and not to throw the baby with the water. And this is what this attempt is what this attempt is all about. To cross everything, to reject everything and start the new religion. Well, well. It is interesting how we can see how this change uh, happened. Look at this. This is, as I said, somebody dates it by a year 140, some even earlier, but it is viewed as the second century. Well, let's look at the interesting uh, text, which is back still in the first century. This is the revelation of John. John says, I was in spirit on the Lord's day. See? It is interesting. You know, people may wonder what the Lord's day is. There is an interesting text I want to bring your, to your attention from the first century. This text is known as Didache, or the uh, uh, teaching of 12 apostles. We don't really know who wrote this text, but uh, we, here is the evidence. Every Lord's Day, do ye gather yourselves together and break bread and give thanksgiving after having confessed your transgressions, and that your sacrifice may be pure. But let no one be at variance with his fellow come together with you until they reconcile that, you, that, that your sacrifice may not be profane and so forth. See, they mention the Lord's day. I'll show you this, uh, a, a passage, a different passage in Didache, where they talk about the preparation day. The same word is used in Luke chapter 23. It was the preparation day, then the Sabbath, and then the first day of the week. You see the contrast? First century is very clear what the Lord's day for everybody and the second century begins to waver. In fact, it is the main thesis of Daniel Boyarin in his book, Judaism and Christianity, Parting the Way, that it was the Sabbath that began, that became the major cornerstone which started the separation between Judaism and Christianity. It was motivated, the change of, it was clearly proven by many scholars that separation between the change and from seventh day of the week to the eighth day was motivated by nothing else but the hatred toward the Jews and the desire to Avoid persecution. But the Bible is very clear about what the Lord's Day is. Look at this text of Scripture. 
It is very plain. You see, this is the Decalogue, and I bring you the Decalogue in two recensions. One is in Exodus chapter 20, another is in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Look at the similarities and differences. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the law of the Lord your God. I, may, I skip the part, and here is the reason. For in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, sea, and what's in them, and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. This is the reason for Sabbath, in Exodus 20. If you look at Deuteronomy 5, you see a little variation. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. This is the same. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So it's, that's very clear what the Lord's day is. The Sabbath, the seventh day. Okay, so... John was very clear what was the Lord's day, as well as uh, the first century uh, text about the Lord's day are very clear. They're absolutely clear, first century Christian literature. So here is the change. And remember that you were slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Whoa. Somebody can read this part and say, this is not about me, it's about them. But Paul is of different opinion. If you are Christ's, then you're Abraham's seed. It means... Through Christ, everybody gets adoption. And if somebody is adopted, he becomes an equal standing part of the family. And now, their history is your history. It's our history. It's us, not them who were slaves in Egypt. Because our father is a loving father. And the loving father, who has natural children and adopted children, does not differentiate. He doesn't even tell. You know, parents, when they adopt, they don't want to tell their adopted child, oh, you know, I didn't give birth to you. Because in Christ, God gave birth to everybody. Do you want to be a part of that? You see, we have to be careful. There is a day of the Lord, which is not only for them, because in Christ, we are children of Abraham. Sharing the common history of salvation and redemption. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to see the lessons from the past, from the old, from the history of Israel, which is the history of anyone who is in Christ. Help us to see the history of the church and learn the lesson today to understand where we are and what we stand for. Amen.